Yeah, well, you are in luck today, because <laughs> um, it's me. Um, I wanted to, is somebody, when I was, I was, this morning I was woken up real early, like at like 3 a.m., and what happened is I had this, like, this crazy pain, like in the right side of my body. I've never woken up in my whole life with pain. Um, do you have pain in your right side? Since last night, extreme pain. Okay. So, um, yeah. So what happened, like I literally was like, woke up, was like, ow! I was like, what the heck is going on right now? I was like, my body doesn't do that. And then I was like, all right, well, I'm just going to pray. I'll pray in tongues. You know, I was praying in tongues. And at five o'clock, guy, what is going on? And I was like, I guess I didn't pray long enough, you know? Um, but I, I just, Father, I thank you that Scott's body is healed. Father, I thank you um, right now that, that whatever pain is being caused, Father, whatever is not working correctly, Father, that we, we call it whole, we call it healed. Father, from the tip of his, his head to the bottom of his feet, Father, is totally aligned with, with you and whatever the Holy Spirit needs to do, Holy Spirit, do it. Do it only you can do inside of Scott's body. Father, I thank you um, that by the end of the day today, Father, that it's gone. Father, that it, whatever it is, whatever was being caused by that, Father, is absolutely and 100% healed in Jesus' name. I agree. I agree. All right. Yeah. You ever get nervous about doing something? That is definitely one of those things. So we already prayed, you know, like we already did the whole thing. I'm like, well, I'm just going to say it because that's what we're supposed to do. Um, so today we're wrapping up our series, Pivot. Okay, so Pivot was the, the last that's three weeks, and I wanted to do something a little bit different this week. Um, I wanted to um, have you guys do something for me. So I want everyone to take out your phone right now. Take it out, take it out, take it out. And I want you to open your notes app on your phone. Not movement app, not, not anything. I want you to actually use your phone in church, okay? It's okay. Parents, if kids are in here, it's okay that they use their phones today. <laughs> Normally we're like, No, so today we're gonna do it a little bit different. Uh, so I want you to use your notes section today. And the reason that I wanted to do this was because um, everything that I'm about to preach today is actually one month's worth of one notes that I took in my phone. So every time I had a thought, every time that I was praying, every time that I was listening to a podcast, every time I was scrolling through, you know, uh, uh, watching a movie, scrolling through a blog, going through all this stuff, I took one note. Because sometimes when you do try to do a lot of things all at one time, what happens is it gets all confusing. And you're like, so I, had, I know myself and I know exactly what I got to do and it's one. I can do one thing at a time. I don't do two things at a time. If I try to do two things at a time, one thing will be left out. So then I will be back to doing one thing because I can only do one thing at a time. You can ask my wife. <laughs> um, come on now. So I want you to take notes in your phone only, only as the Holy Spirit directs you, okay? This is not a, like, I'm gonna tell you, can you put up um, our notes for today for me? That is the only note. <laughs> That's it. There is no Bible verse for you to copy down. There is no one, two, three. There is nothing. This is a time that I believe, I prayed about this a lot last night, that the Holy Spirit is going to spring something up inside of you that is going to be your one thing for you. It's not gonna be a lot of things. It's not gonna be many things, but it is gonna be one thing. And I wanna tell you a little bit about one, okay? Um, everybody say one for me. One. It's, it's just one, right? One for me, baby. <laughs> one for me. It's just one. You know, and oftentimes I think that when we want to see massive change in our, maybe our family life or our spiritual life or, or at work, or we want to see it in our kids, or we want to see these things, we want to see, we want to see miraculous change happen immediately. And that's how we kind of live our life is we, we go by this like, okay, well, I'm going to pray and until God does something huge, I'm going to stay right here. And that's exactly what I'm going to do. But I want to tell you, there's a, there's a huge power in the number one. You know, um, improvement by 1% isn't noticeable, right? You know, no one's going to cheer you on. You don't win trophies for doing 1%. Um, but I want to tell you that 1%, um, it might not even be noticeable at times, but the compound interest of one makes huge, huge gains. So today... Can we ask the Holy Spirit that today we can get 1% better? 
We can get one better. Holy Spirit, I want to be one better today. Whatever that one is, whatever you're speaking to me, whatever is happening inside of my heart, I want to be one better. You know, your habits determine your destiny. You see this all through the Bible. You see this through every major event that has ever happened. It started with one thing. You have, I mean, name name a story. There's one thing that started. It's one thing that kicked it off. You know, so if we take a 1% gain, okay, a 1% compound gain at the end of a year, at the end of 365 days, it will actually produce 37.8 times the amount of one, starting with 1%. You have 1% today, you have 1% of what 1% would be the next day, and then 1% of what 1%, and add, 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 at the end of the day, you'll have 37.8 times more than you would. It's a huge exponential gain once you get going. It's actually miraculous gain in the one. Because when you start to add up, okay, I, I, and this is not a to-do list. I, I wanted to, to say this is not a to-do list. This is not a, okay, I have to do this. Like I have to, if I do this one, I do this one. There was a, a, a study that Benjamin Franklin did. I forget exactly what it was, but it was like 97 things to make you, um, ma- make you like the perfect human ever. And the furthest that he ever got was 16. Okay, so this is, this is not what I'm, I'm not talking about like, okay, tomorrow I'm gonna do this. And then the next day I'm gonna do, I'm talking about maybe it's one, maybe it's 1%. Okay, so one. So if we started, I mean, we can make this a whole lot easier. So we start with a dollar. We all have a dollar. Okay, so if we start with one dollar and we get 1% better at this, 1% compound interest every day, it's continuously accruing, one day better, we're gonna end up with $37 at 1%. Now, when we start talking about money, people are like, okay, okay, I see, I see this a little bit better, but I wanna talk about the other side of that 1% is if you get 1% worse every day, you coast. You just barely, you're like, I don't know, I'm just not gonna put the time in today, I'm not gonna do that. You know what you end up with? Oh, I'm gonna show you. You end up with three pennies. Because we, we get to decide, right? We get to decide what I'm going to do. Like God's going to put this inside of us, but we get to decide whether at the end of this year, you know, and some people are going to have 2% growth, 3% growth, and that's great, awesome. But some people will make the decision not to make a decision. So just like money is multiplied through compound interest, the effects of your habits compound to make a huge difference. Now, this isn't a like do better, be better, your habits, but I am saying that when you start to have better habits, things start to get in line. These past 21 days of, of this fast and prayer have been totally insane for my life. I've read more of the Bible in the past 20 days uh, than ever. I'm going to be honest. Like, I am, a, I am a podcast person. I like podcasts. I like listening to sermons. I like audio books. I want them read to me. So the first couple of days, Pastor Rod put out that prayer list, and I was like, holy Lord, bro, did you see what you have us doing right now? And he was like, oh, man, it is so awesome. And I'm like, yeah, 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 yeah. And, like, there were even disputes on our staff about it. And uh, so finally I was sitting there, and I was like, the Bible can read to me. It can read to me on the Bible app. It reads to me. Oh boy, I put that thing on, started playing, and then I heard Lori in the other room. You're welcome. Her, her Bible, like once again, I'm one track, one focus. Like she has that Bible talking so fast, I can't even understand what they're saying. Like, I mean, I'm telling you, it's just like, like for God's love the world, He gave His only begotten Son, whoever believes in Him should never perish, but have everlasting eternal life. And it's just like, how are you? She's like, I want Him to read as fast as I read. And I was like, okay. So I got her up to one and a quarter, you know what I mean? I mean, I'm really pushing it on there. <laughs> um, short-term sprints won't get you as, as far as a long-term marathon. We've heard this thing forever. But I do want to tell you that short-term sprints do happen. Yeah. These past 21 days, this was a short-term sprint. Yeah. But this is not sustainable. It's not supposed to be sustainable. This is supposed to be a time where we, where we lay off everything. And like Pastor Rod says, the biggest thing that an American can give up is food. 
We got shelter, we have places that we can go, we have warmth, we have those things, but food, that's some serious topics. I mean, I don't know if you have ever gone to uh, pick out a recipe, but when you look at the recipes online and you click that thing, you got paragraphs before you get down to the recipe down here because people are passionate about food. They're like, it was my granddaddy's recipe that was passed down from his great grand. It's called red eye gravy. It's like, okay, just put some coffee. Let's get this thing going. Like how much coffee do I need? You know, like just help me out here. Um, but but they, they do happen, but it's a short-term thing. So we're looking to run our race, right? It's not, it's not a race that's gonna be, you know, sprint, 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 sprint. It's gonna be a very, very long, long race. Um, habits are the compound interest of small improvements. You decide to do something 1% better. And I'm not, even, I'm not gonna say a lot of things about this. I'm literally just trying to dig into your minds about one and 1%. And there's another thing is one degree. See, so, so when we're talking about pivot, I don't know if you have used a protractor when you were <laughs> in high school um, or middle school. Actually, middle schoolers are way smarter than some high schools were back when I was in. Okay, so, um, but you got a protractor and you look on that thing, you can't even find one degree. One degree wasn't even there. You had five, you had 10, you had all the fives all the way through this whole thing, but there was never a one degree mark. When you're talking about one degree, it's not really noticeable. So when you have a, a foot, okay, if we were gonna go from one foot, I got a size 13 here, that's a big foot. Um, so if I were to go one foot in front of the other and I was one degree off, I would only be 0.2 inches off, right? That's not, that is like nothing, you know what I mean? Like that's like, okay, well I can just recorrect, right? I can just correct this, boop, there we go, one, one degree. And I probably just moved like nine degrees right there, like that little move, because one degree is so minute. And after 100 yards, right? After 100 yards, you're only talking about five and a half feet, just over five and a half feet. You could still have a wide receiver probably catch a football that was five and a half feet off. Maybe, you know, you don't got maybe five and a half feet here, but you're, you're getting close if you're one degree off. Uh, but then we start talking a little bit bigger. And once again, we're not sprinting. We're not, we're not a wide receiver that's sprinting 100 yards. We're trying to go as far as we can go. So we have after a mile, one mile, 5,280 feet, you're gonna be off by 92.2 feet. Things are starting to get a little more serious here. I mean, 100 feet is the length of the building here, so if you went a mile and you were off by that much, that's, that's a, this gap is starting to increase kind of exponentially when you think about it, because it's, it's a little scary. You're getting one degree, one degree, and you're like, wait, wait, wait. God called me to here, but I didn't pivot because I wanted to decide to do this way, but it just didn't listen to this one little thing. It was just small. So I'm, I'm gonna keep going this way. And then after, a, a, you know, 100 yards, you know, I was only off five feet. Like, God, he's right there. Like, that's, it's okay. It's gonna be okay. But the problem comes along when we start to go the actual distance and we're wondering where God is and he's 92 feet in the other direction. See, if we were traveling from San Francisco to Washington, D.C., you'd end up on the other side of Baltimore, 42 miles away. Traveling around the globe, if you went straight around the globe from Washington, D.C. to Washington, D.C., you would miss Washington, D.C. by 500 or 435 miles. Just one time around the earth. If I was traveling to the moon, I got in a rocket, I called Elon Musk, I was like, beam me up, Scotty, and we went for it. If I was going to the moon, I'd be 4,169 miles off. That's twice the diameter, almost twice the diameter of the moon away. Do you think it would be okay that you were in a rocket ship and NASA had done all the calculations and they were off by one degree? One degree starts to add up. See, if you were going to the sun, you'd miss the sun by 1.6 million miles. That's twice the diameter of the sun. That's a big, I don't know if, you know, I remember when we were growing up and we had the, the planets on the, uh, like in our textbooks and it was always like the sun and they were all like the same size, right? And then I started like really digging into a little bit of astrology and trying to figure out all the fun things that are up in the sky that God has left up there for me to look at. Astronomy, sorry. And uh, <laughs> yeah, and uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, Capricorn, Cancer, no, okay. So, um, so when we start looking at those things, and I started to realize that the sun is a whole lot bigger than I thought. Oh, yeah, yeah, come on. Saturn is a whole lot bigger. 
All these things are way bigger than I once imagined them. I was like, oh, okay, so missing the sun by two times the diameter of the sun, that's a big deal. Yeah, yeah but it's only 1%. It's only, it's only one degree off. I mean, here, it you know, wasn't that big of a deal. When I started, it's not that big of a deal. But as I'm going through my life and I'm, I'm veering one degree off, and I'm, not, I'm saying one degree is almost not noticeable doing it. The problem is, is when you're one, one degree out and you're, you know, you're 500 miles off, and then you're like, you know what? I'm already this far. I might as well keep going. Instead of taking that other one degree and going one degree back. And trying to meet up where you're supposed to go. Yes. The goal is not just to stay where you are. Things are always changing. Listen, I'm going I'm to tell you guys a real quick story. Um, but one degree really, really starts to add up. And this is, this is I love this verse, like it popped out at me, because um, we were talking about one degree. In 2 Corinthians, okay, these are things I don't want you to write down. I just want you to listen and listen to what Holy Spirit is saying. I know that people want to write them down. I want one thing for you. And we all with unveiled face continually seen as in a mirror, the glory of the Lord, are being progressively transformed into his image from one degree of glory wow. to even more glory, which comes from the Lord, which is his spirit. Wow. So we're getting one degree of God over and over and over and over and over, and it starts to add up. We're going from one degree of who he was into who he is. We're trying to find out, get our minds right, and be like, okay, this is who God is. And then God's like, here's another piece of me. And you're like, God, you've changed. Well, he doesn't change. We've changed. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna see one degree better of God. And eventually, that one degree, two degree, three degree, four degree, five degree, it's gonna start opening up, and then we're gonna be able to see God for who he really is. See, God's not going to change, but I think our, our vision gets a little closed. We start to see just out of a little sliver of who he is. And then what happens is our eyes start to widen, and we get to be able to see exactly what we need to see. And then sometimes that's going to close back in, and it's not because you want it to happen. It's because God's going to do that. You say, whoa, 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 we got a little too wide here. Let's focus in. So I want to talk about Paul's pivot to Rome. Um, he, uh, th this guy, like when we were reading Acts, my mind was just blown again. I just, I love it. I, I, Acts has really been kind of this big thing for me. And in Acts, he, he's, Paul is, is doing one thing. He has one story that he's trying to tell. He was on a horse, okay, or whatever he was going on the road to Damascus. And here comes, here comes God. And this is what happens. Suddenly a bright light from heaven flashed around me. This is Paul telling the Sanhedrin, which is like the... Uh, like supreme court of the Jewish people, which is where he was there trying to kill him. And I fell to the ground. And I heard a voice say to me, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? I asked. I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting, he replied. My companions saw the light and they did not understand the voice of him who was speaking to me. What shall I do, Lord? I asked. Get up, the Lord said, and go to Damascus. There you will be told all that you have been assigned to do. My companions led me by the hand into Damascus because the brilliance of the light had blinded me. A man named Ananias came to see me, and he was a devout observer of the law and highly respected by all Jewish, Jews living there. He stood beside me and said, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that moment, I was able to see. Then the Lord said to me, Go, and I will send you far away to the Gentiles. There was one moment where his life was totally wrecked. And so what Paul does in this, is, before he starts doing all the crazy stuff, now he's going and he's preaching. He's doing the stuff that he's called to do. He's supposed to be preaching to the Gentiles, but he really stayed around the Jewish people for a long time. And then he got brought before the Sanhedrin because they were saying like, you're, you are messing up. You're doing all this bad stuff. You are. And he's like, no, 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 I'm not. I am just doing what Jesus has actually called me to do. I'm doing the one thing when I was messed up, when I was out there trying to kill and imprison Christians, I'm doing the one thing that I was told to do, and I'm going to go do it. So they have this big debacle, and all these things are going on. He, he makes a pivot, and he's like, you know what? Like the, Ro Rome, the Roman uh, uh, Empire gets involved, and he has to go. He goes to jail. They take him away for his own safety. They try to bring him back. It's a really, really long story, but at the, at the end of this, you, Paul is trying to get to Caesar because he is a Roman citizen. He's saying, I need to go to Rome. I want to put this in front of Caesar, or else he would have died. They would, they would have tried to kill him, and he, they, they would have succeeded. So he said, I want to go to, I go to Rome. 
I want to go see, um, see uh, Emperor Nero. That's who it was. I want to go see Caesar. And so he makes these little pivots. He's pivoting from Jerusalem. And then he's going into, you know, he's going up on this ship. And then he's going to this place. And what happens is, like, it's awful. Like, some of these things, if they happen to me, that's not what I want. I'm like, I know that I'm supposed to go to Rome. Like, like God told me, okay, I'm going to preach to the Gentiles. I'm going to Rome. That's where I'm going to go. And I get on a ship, and then the ship wrecks. And then the, it's shipwrecked, and then you get out, and you're, there are these, these indigenous people to the area are telling you to pick up firewood, and you go pick up firewood, and then you get bit by a viper? No, sir, no. And then Paul, like, like it's crazy as Paul is, and what he believes, gets bit, and he's just like, eh, and flings it off into the fire. And like, the people around him are like, oh, you're fitting to swell up and die. You must have done something bad out there. You're going to die, and nothing happens. They're like, he didn't swell up. And they're like, you must be a god. And he's like, no. <laughs> so he makes his way into Rome. And then guess what? At the end of Acts, that's exactly where it ends. Yep. Oh. It does not tell you that he made it to Caesar. Right. So bad. I, I was listening to this. I was just walking around my neighborhood and I was like, whoo. And like, you know, he's shipwrecked. He's doing this stuff. And all of a sudden I was like, we're, maybe my phone skipped. Like maybe I hit it in my pocket, went back. Like, okay. He's like, Hmm. Um, what is going on here? <laughs> I've missed something. And here is kind of what I what I believe is that if Paul didn't make this this one change, we would have we would have missed out on something. And, and when God calls you to do something, it's not always that He's calling you to do that one thing; is that He's trying to get you somewhere so you can go do the thing that He's trying to get you to do. And the thing is, it kind of looks like one degree. It kind of looks like one percent. kind of looks like one thing. He's going to get you here, and then he's going to move it. You know, but if, if Paul never went and pivoted this way, we would have missed out on the prison epistles. When he's in prison, this is what he writes. He wrote uh, Philemon. He wrote Colossians. He wrote Philippians. And he wrote Ephesians. And in, Felicia, uh, in, in, in Ephesians, I just want to go through some of these because these are what we would have missed out on. Yeah, I know. Felicians, I like that. <laughs> Ephesians, I was just mixing them all like Felicola Tipitians. So those are the prison epistles all in one word. Uh, is, is we, would have been, we would have missed imitating Christ. We would have missed guidelines for a healthy and godly marriage. We would have missed saved by grace. We would have missed the calling of apostles Prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Not going to bed angry. The armor of God in making the most of every opportunity. See, in Ephesians 5, 15 through 16, it says, So be very careful how you live, not being like those with no understanding, but live honorably with true wisdom, for we are living in evil times. Take full advantage of every day as you spend your life for his purpose and don't live foolishly for then you will have uh, discernment to fully understand God's will. Take advantage of every day. If you, you wanna know about God's will, it ends with this whole God's will, don't worry about missing God. If, if, if it's good, it's God. That's where you wanna be. If your life is fulfilled and your life is, is feeling the things that you're supposed to, you're, you're there. Okay, this is not a like, I'm gonna totally, like, like you're in the will of God. This isn't a thing that we have to understand. If there's peace in it, you're there. If it's good, it's God. You know, so God has this plan for me, but I have a part. So the one thing that, that I wanted to, to kind of end with is this, this term that's obedience. See, because I believe we all have this one thing of obedience, that if Jesus came in obedience, and he died in obedience. This is one of the things that, you know, we have this, you know, love the Lord your God with all your heart. You know, the second is like, is love your neighbor as yourself. That, that's great. But those, both of those require one thing, obedience. It requires you to do one thing, which is to obey. And I know in this culture of like, I'm not going to submit. I'm the leader. I'm the this. I'm the top guy. I'm the, listen, it's okay. It's okay to learn how to serve. I didn't know how to serve before I came here. I knew how to lead. I knew how to get a group of teenagers fired up and having fun and baptizing them and, and getting them saved and doing all that, but I had no idea how to follow these two people. I would say I would. I'm like, okay, yes, whatever. 
you know, and then go back and be like, God, stupid, why would he even this? But now it's different because I learned to obey. That if, if Paul had his Timothy and I want to be Timothy, Timothy's not talking about Paul behind his back. Timothy's leading people to the teachings of Paul in this. So it's obedience. We get called into obedience. Um, listen, and, and we begin to pivot towards what God wants for us. Um, we do it out of obedience to God, and that obedience will actually, it will actually spring up within us our God-given desires. See, obedience we see as like, don't do that, don't do that. No, no, that's not what obedience is. Like, my dogs, when I tell them to come, come. Do you know why they come? Because I pet them, and I love them. And I tickle their bellies, and then I grab them around the throat, and then the one starts fighting with the other one. Like, they like it. So their obedience to me is not a, oh, here I come, oh. Like, their obedience to me is when I say, come here, Chew! as fast as they can, jumping up, ah! going wild. See, obedience doesn't have to be this thing where, okay, I'm, I'm coming. Like, will obedience be like that sometimes? Absolutely. Yes. If you messed up, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Okay? Um, you know, but God isn't going to force his will on your life. Right. He can't. He's not going to do it. What he wants, though, is obedience. Unfortunately, obedience is ours to, to take. Um, the safest place to be is where God is. Or we can say it like this. Obedience is the safest place to be. See, wherever God is, I want to be there. Like, if, if we're supposed to do something that God has asked me to do, I want to, I want to do it. <laughs> I don't want to not do it <laughs> because that's not safe. It may be scary here of what I'm going to do, but I want to do it anyways. Yeah. Because if God is in it, then okay, well, if God's there, I, I want to do whatever he's doing. I want to be a part of that so I can get in on it because it's going to happen. Someone else is going to do it, but I want to do it. You know, what I, what I believe is that... Um, we all know the story of David and Bathsheba, right? And we all, like a lot of people think that it's, it's a really about sex drive. It was about David, like, and he's just, you know, he is just looking over and bam, he sees this bathing woman. Um, but I was kind of rocked this week when I was reading um, in 2 Samuel 11, and it says David, uh, it said in the springtime when kings were supposed to be out to war. So this, this wasn't a sex drive thing. This was a, he didn't pivot right. He didn't make the decision. He didn't say, kings are supposed to be out to war. It's spring. Now we have all this food. The harvest is in, and this is what kings do is we go out to war. But he stayed. He made one decision that messed up a whole bunch of stuff for him. Then he started making another decision. Well, we're going to have to kill that guy. We're going to send him to the front lines. But it was all because he was, he was out of season. He didn't pivot right. He wasn't listening. He wasn't doing what was supposed to be done. He didn't pivot correctly. So in the seasons of one, this is where we're going to end, um, how are we supposed to look at what we're doing? In 2 Corinthians 4.18, in the NIV, it says, so we fix our eyes, not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. We're not supposed to fix our eyes on the one, like right here, right now, this exact thing. Our prize is eternal. Our prize is going to be way down the line. But what I want to do is I want to start pivoting towards that now. If I was promised heaven on earth, like that's what we were promised. We are supposed to pull heaven down to earth, and this is supposed to be a holy place. I want this church to pivot towards that. I want me to pivot towards that. I want to pivot towards anything that God wants me to do because in obedience, I'm going to find safety because in that obedience is God. See, these are maybe a little hard pills to swallow, maybe a few things that are kind of rubbing you the wrong way. That's your one. You get to listen to it. You get to ask the Holy Spirit what to do. I'm gonna go through a little list real quick of a few things, and there's just three areas of one, and we're gonna wrap this up real fast. And You know, in family, in family, um, the power of one starts in your family, and it's you. It's not him, it's not her, it's not them, it's not they, it's you. If you want change in your family, it starts with you. 
want revival to break out in your house? Revival starts in you first. You know, if things are going to change, then you have to make the change. And change doesn't happen overnight. Change is a process. Change is 1%, it's one degree, it's one thing. You know, in finances, one thing. You could start, if you don't already give, that's okay. But this is what I want, I want to ask you to do, is to give 1%. 1%. Because I believe that 1% starts to add up. It starts to become exponential. When I, had, when I had $1 that I started with and I ended with 37, if I can give God $1, if I can give him 1% and I know that he is the God of increase, that he is the, the God that owns all the, hi, the cows on the hill, okay? So if he has that, he can exponentially grow my dollar that I can do. I can't grow it. I tried the stock market. I lost like $260 in a day. Thank you, Bitcoin. Okay? <laughs> I'm being real. I can't do it, but what I can do is make one decision. I wanted to start to do something different for God, so I left my friends. I wanted to do something different, so I said, you know what, I'm gonna go to this church. I started to go to this church. I started to wanna go to Bible school. I made that pivot and went to Bible school, and then I got a job offer back home, and I made a little thing here, and then I got in front of teenagers and was like, I don't know what I'm doing, but I'm going to do it. And then 1%, 1%. Then we started having kids baptized in service. We had keg parties. Yes, with root beer. Hold on. And we had all sorts of parties. For, we had crazy things that happened. And then we pivoted again up to North Alabama. It was one decision, one tiny thing that has brought me to today. It's 1%. It's one degree. It's one thing. And I believe the Holy Spirit is going to tell you one thing today. What's one thing that I can do better? One thing that I can pray about? What's one thing, uh, one person that I can encourage today? One thing I can be thankful for today? One thing that I enjoy today? And one thing to let go of today? See, for some, it, it may not be adding anything else to your life, but it, it may be taking something that you're already doing and saying, you know what? It's gone. I'm getting this totally out of my life because it can't be a part of of me anymore. So today I want to I want to take 30 seconds. You guys have your phones. If you already have your one, that's awesome, but I do want to take 30 seconds of just total quiet and I want you to write down your one thing. The Holy Spirit will talk to you. He has talked to you. What's your one thing? 1 degree, 1%. today if, if you haven't made the decision to um, <laughs> know the one true God and his one son um, I want to give you that opportunity um, with every eye closed and heads bowed I'm just going to pray a prayer um, and if that's you we have, we'll have prayer we'll have Miss Lori over here I'm ready to talk to you. And if you've made that decision, we want to celebrate you and freak out with you and scream with you and all of the things. So today, if this is you, just, just say this in your heart is, God, I give you my entire life that you would be glorified. Do in me whatever pleases you, that your name would be exalted. Do in my family and do in my home that which delights your heart. Amen. Listen, we got one thing. It's not a lot. One thing that can set our course for our family for generations, that can set bad things back right, can set up a lot of things with just one. 
Father, we thank you. We love you. Father, we're so encouraged that there's only one thing to do. (laughs) There's just one. Father, because you sent the one, we get to get in on it. We get to have that growth. We get to have um, good habits. Father, that we get to lay our hearts down in obedience to whatever you want. Father, we just thank you for this. Father, we thank you that we get to, to, to get in on what's happening in this earth. Father, that you love this earth so much that you sent Jesus, then now we get to tell people about our best friend. Father, we thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen.